Welcome everybody. Welcome to the uh, the keynote session of the day. So this is session one uh, SC, and uh, this is uh, a session with Mark Nelson. He's from uh, Rackiff Development, and uh, he's going to be uh, talking about a, a fantastic topic: mainframes in the moon. So we uh, we Mark came to uh, deliver this session on the security stream at the conference last year and it was so good that we actually had another viewing in the evening just with a few of the committee members which was great there was beer and there was wine and there was snacks and things and uh and i said when we were when we were doing the planning this year i thought it was one of those sessions we've just got to have it on the keynote you know uh, candidate list so uh here you are mark so a very warm welcome. Um, like I said, the, for the purpose of feedback, this is session 1SC, and uh, I'll, I'll remind you of that at, uh, at the end. Um, so, Mark, take it away. The stage is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Jamie, and uh, good afternoon to, to everybody. And thank you very much for inviting me. This is, uh, I'm a mainframer from, from the day I took my first programming class, and I put my uh, deck of cards into an RJE session at the Polytechnic Institute of New York and got some magic output well, full of JCL errors and programming errors, but that's okay. That's how we all started, I suspect. Uh, I've loved the mainframe since then. I've had the opportunity to work on machines as small as a three, System 360 Model 20, all the way up to the current Z15. Uh, amazing technology, and there's such a rich history with the technology. And I just wanted to share this one small aspect of it, and that's mainframes, and how the mainframes were involved in the US Lunar Manned Program. And I do say it's the greatest technical achievement in uh, the history of mankind. We can argue about that if we were over at Whittlebury or, or, or any place where the conference held, we'd have that argument over beer, but it is one of the greatest technological achievements in mankind. So let's talk about what we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk about the IBM mainframe. We're not going to talk about all of the other great technologies that were used as a part of the manned lunar program. We're not going to talk about the radar stations, the data collection stations. I await those people who wrote those technologies and created those technologies to tell their stories. We're only going to, we're not going to talk much about the Apollo command module and the great hardware and software that ran in there. Hardware created by Raytheon on software created by MIT. Uh, we're not going to talk much about uh, the, anything past the lunar landing in July of 1969. I do want to talk a little bit about the space shuttle program because there was a major mainframe involvement with that. So uh, first off, a big thank you. If any of you worked on any of these machines or any of these programs, thank you. We walk in the footsteps of giants. And I recognize that every time I go into work. And one of my great regrets about not being able to go into Poughkeepsie is I can't be in the same place where the people who 50 years ago uh, created this technology. So this session started as a session over at Marist College at the Enterprise Computing Conference. And the purpose of that conference is to talk about how do we talk about enterprise computing computing and how do we talk about mainframes? And sadly, I don't think we do a very good job. And I suspect many of us here in this virtual room have done this. When somebody says, well, what, what's a mainframe? You pull out a paper card, a, a good old fashioned punch card. You probably have a couple in your desk. You use them for note paper and you explain how it works. Or you show pictures of spinning reel to reel tapes because you could look at it and say, I know what that is. That's a tape drive. Or you talk about the punches or a disk drive. That's a five meg disk drive. Uh, being loaded into an aircraft. Do you talk about these room filling processors? Yes, that's all part and parcel about what a mainframe is. And sometimes we even see people lying. I love this photo. This was supposed to be a home computer sometime, uh, you know, sometime last century. Well, home, first off, and I've heard people call this, this is what a mainframe looks like. First off, if this were a mainframe, I'd be the first person to be an operator on it dials and switches and that really cool wheel right in the middle. Uh, that's absolutely awesome. But no, this is a completely fake photo. But the point is, is that people, if they look at this and were told that this is a mainframe, would believe it because we don't convey what the real value of a mainframe is, what the real value of a modern mainframe is. We tend to focus on the history and, and we need to recognize the history, but we have to recognize the present and the future as well. All of this, I think, misses the point. And the secret of mainframe technology is hidden in plain sight. It's hidden in the name of the company, International Business Machines. The purpose of this technology is not technology for the sake of technology, is to achieve business goals. And it pretty much doesn't matter what your business is, whatever your business is, 
we can help with a mainframe. So whether you're doing financial, transactional kinds of things or hospitality reservation systems or transportation systems and logistics plannings, we can help. And even if your job is just putting things into the air, taking things and putting them into space and getting them to the moon, guess what? Mainframe can help with that as well. So let's tell the story of the mainframe as a tool, as, as something that helped achieve a business objective and one of the most technological, uh, significant technological achievements of all time, and that is the landing on the moon. So why is this a good story? Well, it's a story that involves everything that a good story should have. It's got life and death drama. If things go wrong, people will die. And in fact, things went wrong and people died. There was a singularity of vision and purpose, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The characters who were involved in it were engaging folks. I, I remember growing up, I grew up in Queens, New York, and I was, uh, I was there as a kid as these programs, we'll talk about the programs in a moment, were, were going along. And these gentlemen who were astronauts were our heroes. They were engaging characters, they were interesting. And then there's the technology, every aspects of technology, physics, chemistry, electrical engineering, computer science, before we knew to call it computer science, material science, all of that was involved. And yeah, there was a huge political component because while we like to think 50 years ago, everybody thought this was a great idea, not everybody did and thought the resources could be better used elsewhere. Uh, we had to understand and create new ways of managing finance, managing procurement, managing the flow of information. We'll talk about that in a moment. And above all, looking in hindsight, there were trials, tribulations, and after all of that, a happy ending. So I've kind of cut right to the chase, but I think everybody knows we landed on the moon. <laughs> so it's also a story about the times. Now, 1968 was a particularly stressful time in the world and particularly in the United States. We were in the midst of the Vietnam War. There were riots in the streets, protests in the streets. We had the assassination of Martin Luther King and the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. So really an awful year, but it ends uh, in the most uh, positive of ways, most uh, opti optimistic of ways. That photo, now called Earthrise, was taken by Apollo 8 as it did the uh, one of the circles around the moon. They were surprised as they came around from the dark side of the moon after that first, exactly how beautiful it was. And they scrambled, got a camera, and captured that iconic photo. And some people believe that photo, the blue marble in the vastness of dark space helped trigger and helped focus the environmental causes that became uh, rather significant in the uh, early 70s. So it's a story about the times, terrible year, ends very optimistically, and then comes 1969. Now, I mentioned that I grew up in Queens, New York, and in Queens, New York, there is a football team, and if Mr. Wilson is listening, yes, I get it, it's US football, it's not played with the foot, and the, it really isn't a ball, got it, all right, but the New York Jets, who'd been in existence for, I think, about three years at that time, boldly promised that they would win the Super Bowl, they were 17-point underdogs, and they won, a gentleman by the name of Joe Namath, uh, Broadway Joe Namath, he was called after that, so that was, that was a great way to start the year, but we have other things going on, we have Woodstock, Stock. We have the New York Mets, who, who are an underdog baseball team taking the World Series. We have the premiere of Sesame Street, a very, very popular children's program here in the US and I'm told around the world. We have the first flight of the Concorde. We have the first CICS or Kicks release. And smack dab in the middle of that, we have the landing of the moon, on the moon. So 1969 was a great year to be alive. And for this kid who was 10 years old at the time, it didn't get any better than that. Well, it did, but didn't think it was going to at the time. So where did all of this happen? Some people believe this began when uh, John F. Kennedy said, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving this goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. Thankfully, he put that second clause in because I've worked in government contracting agencies and you do exactly what you're told and only what you're told. So if he said, let's land on the moon and didn't have that other piece in there, there'd be some saying, you know, we're going outside the bounds of this contract. So thank you, President Kennedy, for, for starting us down the right path. A year later, there was, there was a lot of opposition and people were questioning whether this was the right, right move. And uh, President Kennedy doubled down. We choose to do we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because this goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies of skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one that we are unwilling to postpone, and one that we intend to win. 
those are pretty motivating statements. And uh, I think that also helped pr propel this from just a thought a few years earlier to the reality that it would become uh, seven years later. But page back a little bit uh, to a little bit earlier. Why were we in this space race? Well, the Soviet Union had put Sputnik, first satellite orbit, in October of 1957. Now remember, what, what did Sputnik do? It was the size of a beach ball, large beach ball, a three foot in diameter, circled the Earth, and just every few seconds went beep, 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 which everybody in the US understood to mean, you suck, we're here first, ha ha. So there was a bit of concern, and, and the, the reality of it was there was a huge focus on making sure that our STEM curriculum our science, technology, engineering, and uh, uh, all the technology ones would, would grow and start being focused on in our schools, right? But even with just Sputnik, a few years later, in 62, Yuri Gagarin becomes the first human in space. Again, a, a country that believes itself to have technology leadership is now 0 for 2 on the world stage. But all of this, I think, was really set in motion post-World War II, right? When the uh, victors of World War II were dividing up the sphere of influence, the spheres of influence. And they, they determined what the, what the uh, land would be, they determined what the sea would be, but at those conferences in Yalta and Potsdam, uh, nobody knew what was going to happen in the air, right, and in space. So I think all of these come together to provide a momentum that puts us on this plan to put men on the moon. So the stages of the U.S. space program, there were there are four basic ones leading up to this point. The first one was Project Vanguard. Now, Project Vanguard had a very simple goal. Let's launch a satellite into space. Right. So the very first of these liftoffs, a very highly publicized one in late 1957, right? one of these Vanguard rockets is lighted and it rises majestically four, five, six feet off the launch pad. It wobbles and it falls over and explodes. Right, what a humiliating experience. The videos are out on YouTube, should you want to take a look at them. Uh, but this was not, not a beginning. But we did manage to launch a satellite successfully off a of Vanguard rocket a month and a half later in January of 1958. But again, remember, the Soviet Union had already been there. So yeah, it's nice to be to the party, but we got there a little bit late. So as, they would make, as we made the commitment to go into space, we recognized that there would be steps that would have to be taken. It would have to be an incremental process. You just don't launch and go to the moon for a step. You haven't developed the technologies. So you need to have a space program to develop those technologies. The first one, Project Mercury. The goal was one human in orbit and return to Earth safely. Again, make, getting back is an important part of the, of the, uh, of the uh, proposition. Alan Shepard. Uh, takes a 15 minute suborbital flight in uh, May of 1961. Uh, and you know, to be honest with you, it's, it's great. We proved the technology works, but you still haven't done the orbit. That privilege goes to John Glenn. He does a flight in 1962 in February. But remember, the Soviet Union had been there for almost a year at that point. But at this, at least this point, we understand the technologies necessary for moving things out of Earth's gravity to putting things into orbit. And now we can leverage that to start planning what's going to be the, the lunar mission envisioned for, uh, well, by the end of the decade. So second in these, or the third of these is Project Gemini. And, and Gemini, the twin, is aptly named. It's two astronauts going into space. So two flew 10 missions. And the whole purpose of this was to work out all the maneuvers that we knew would be necessary for a real lunar mission. And what were those things? The first thing was extravehicular activity. Put that spacesuit on and take that spacewalk. The second one was uh, spacecraft uh, uh, rendezvous and docking. So they launched two Geminis and had them find each other in space and then had them link up. This is actually a pretty interesting logistical question, uh, issue because you have to have positive control on both of these at the same time at a fairly, uh, fairly decent granularity so you can get them close enough to actually do the docking. And the third thing is, this was the first flight where they started doing extended duration. They realized that get to the moon and back is a seven day proposition. So you have to be able to get folks and enough of provisions into space so they can survive for seven days. And I, you know, I, I pity Frank Borman um, and, uh, and, his, and the gentleman who flew with him, whose name escapes me for a moment. And um, you know, seven days next to each other in something smaller than a Yugo. Uh, 
they had to have become best friends. They used to joke about their, their special relationship that they had during those seven days. So that's what Project Gemini was. Project Apollo was three astronauts with the goal of a lunar landing, right? They had uh, 12 missions. The, the entire program started off uh, absolutely on the worst way it could possibly have. During a test mission in January of 1967, well, they were just the astronauts, uh, Grissom, Chafee, and White are inside the capsule, and they're simply going through a simulation of what's going to happen during takeoff. And the worst thing you can imagine happens, there's a fire. And in a 100% oxygenated environment, and in an environment where the escape hatch was not designed, or that the capsule hatch wasn't designed for rapid escape, they quickly perished. So this, this fire really almost canceled and the entire lunar program. Gene Kraft had an interesting observation. He was the famous controller from Apollo 13 and was a, 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 a flight director for many of the flights. Uh, and he said that the Apollo one, Apollo one mission nearly killed the Apollo program, but it certainly saved it. And I think what he meant by that was they looked at every aspect of the program and said, we're going to investigate this and make sure that this won't happen again. And any issue that could cause the compromise of the flight will be understood, investigated, and every possible risk mitigated. In fact, after the incident, very shortly after it, uh, Kraft takes his controllers into a room and he writes the words tough and competent on the board. And what he means by that is that this team of controllers will supervise everything that's going on, every piece of development, every piece of education, every piece of hardware, every piece of software. And if they recognize that there's something unusual, they will raise their hand and they will stop the process until it gets fixed. So that's Apollo 1, an auspicious, an inauspicious beginning. Uh, we have uh, several Apollo missions that are basically test flights of, of rockets and, and, and other sort of things. Apollo 7 is the first resumption of manned tests. And it's, it's interesting, that was pretty, pretty quick, January, 20, January of 67, and they resume actual manned testing in October of 1968. So that's the first flight of the, uh, of the Saturn rocket, uh, along with the Apollo, uh, the rest of the Apollo hardware. The next mission that was scheduled, Apollo 8, was supposed to be the lunar module checkout mission. Lunar module we'll talk about in a moment, uh, made by a company called Grumman Aerospace and Bethpage, Long Island. I worked for Grumman for a couple of years, great company great company. The, um, but it turns out the, there were issues with the lunar module. And with about three and a half months notice, including time to get presidential approval, they decided to take that mission, which was Apollo 8, which was a lunar module checkout, and move it out and instead bring in the next mission, which was going to be a, uh, a navigation to the moon and an orbiting of the moon, everything without a landing. That's pretty impressive, pretty aggressive. They could do that kind of change activity. Uh, so that's Apollo 8. Apollo 9 ended up being the lunar module checkout. Apollo 10 is a complete dress rehearsal with everything except the touchdown on the lunar surface. They got within about five miles. And I remember as a kid saying, you think they'll just go for it? And they didn't uh, because that was not their mission. Uh, they were fully fueled. They could have done it, but no, they, they did exactly as they were told. And then of course we have in July of, 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 80, of uh, 69, we have the actual successful landing. So that in a nutshell is the program but what about the mainframes? I hear you cry. But by the way, I, I should point out, I am wearing my official Apollo 11 tie. Love that tie. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the mainframes and we're gonna go well, well back from 1969. We're actually gonna go back to the 50s. Uh, actually, a little, little bit earlier than that. So IBM created something called the, uh, the ASIC. It was actually a completely mechanical computing machine. It was like a desktop mechanical uh, device, except it was on steroids, absolutely steroids. It was called the uh, Automatic Sequence Control Calculator or the Harvard Mark I because we did much of the design work with Harvard University. Uh, IBM and Harvard had a little bit of a disagreement, so we kind of split off from Harvard at that point. And, th that, and the next machine that, that IBM produces is this, this machine called the Selective Service Elect Selective Sequence Electronic Calculator, or the SSEC. It's built up in IBM Endicott, New York, and IBM builds one of these and puts it right in the middle of Manhattan. 
right? Puts it on 57th Street and Madison Avenue in a big wall where I'm told you could actually look in and see it. And if you wanted to use it, you could rent it. It's one of the first time sharing machines. You could say, I want to use it. And it's, and I think it was something like 300 bucks an hour, which is probably a couple of thousand an hour in today's dollars. If you were an academic institution, well, you could actually use it for free. So universities like Columbia University would come down, spend time with it and, and do some of their calculations. Interesting thing about this machine, it had the uh, electromechanical part, but it also had an electronic part that was used for high speed calculations. So it had about uh, 12,500 vacuum tubes and that did the arithmetics, the control and had a couple of high speed registers, eight of them, average access time of about of less than one millisecond, right? Uh, the rest of the processing was 21,400 relays with an access time of about 20 times that, about 20 milliseconds. So you can see the advantage that electronic processing has over electromechanical. I think this really solidified uh, in folks' minds that, yeah, the electronic way is a much better way than these, these relay-based machines. Now, one of the things that was done, and I think with some researchers from uh, Columbia University, they came down, they used the free time, and they used it to calculate position information of the moon and the planets. And some of that data was actually input to some of the work that was done on the Apollo program. So our next step up, we're gonna look at the, remember we had Vanguard as the first set of the, uh, of the missions, right? So in preparation and uh, for the execution of the Vanguard program, uh, NASA establishes the Project Vanguard Computer Center, right? Now that was an established computing uh, installation. It was in Washington, DC, established in 1957 with a backup in of all places, Poughkeepsie, New York. Now, what did it consist of? It consisted of an IBM 709 in each location. And we'll talk about the 709 in, in, the, in the moment. And it supported orbital calculations and tracking data from satellites. I can't say this is a real-time machine yet, uh, but we're getting there. We're getting to the point where information is coming in. It can be processed so quickly that it can be used in real time. So let's talk about the 709. It's a completely vacuum tube technology. So uh, we've gotten past relays at this point. How do we, we'd call this a risk machine nowadays. It only had 180 instructions. Uh, it was an improved version of the 704, which was our, our prior scientific machine. Uh, it had some interesting novel things. One of the things it had was something called the data synchronizer unit. Some people have made it, uh, said it's analogous to direct memory access or DMA. I think it's much more uh, analogous to the concept of the channel, the channel being a separate dedicated processor whose sole purpose is to manage IO. So we see the evolution of the things we've come to know and love today on the mainframe going back 50 plus years. Didn't have a lot of memory, 32K roughly of 36 bit words. Uh, and of course, magnetic store, uh, co magnetic core memory. There's, we, we, could, we could spend hours just talking about the evolution of storage, but magnetic core was quite bleeding edge at the time. 42,000 uh, additions or subtractions uh, could do about 5,000 multiplications and divisions. Uh, so we're not really talking about something that was by today's standard of a, 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 a process, but in those days, this is about as good as it got. One thing I found interesting is that on the 709, there was a software load that you could put into it that made it look like a 704. Remember when you went from one machine to another machine back in these days, the architectures weren't necessarily compatible. So here's an example where somebody said, I need to preserve my software investment. I don't wanna to have to throw out all of the software that I've written. I can rewrite it over time if I need to be, but I can run it in emulation mode. And again, that, that's a recognition of the business value of software. And that's why upward compatibility is, has been a, a, a keystone of the, uh, of the IBM mainframe. All right, so that was Project Vanguard. Now let's move on to Project Mercury. So remember, Project uh, Vanguard was just get a satellite up, Project Mercury, get a, get a uh, launch one man into space and bring him back. So this is established in 1960 at the Goddard Space Center. It's in Greenbelt, Maryland. We've upgraded. It's no longer 709s, it's 7090s, and it's three of them. And what this was used to do was consolidate tracking information from all possible all, all places from which we were getting input and then provide real-time information to the controllers sitting in Cape Canaveral, now Cape Kennedy, so they could keep the mission updated and keep things going. Uh, this was a special purpose operating system for this, right, with limited multi-programming. Uh, capabilities. So we're still looking at the kind of operating system was doing mostly one thing at a time. 
interesting thing about 7090 is wh where did the name come from? And the story I was told, and I have only, I haven't been able to validate the, the, this, so I'm, I'm kind of sharing rumor, but it's kind of a fun one. It makes sense. Is the 709 was a vacuum tube machine. And in a two year period, IBM replaced its entire vacuum tube line with a transistorized line that was, equ was equivalent. We'll talk about the advantages in, in a moment. In fact, actually, let's talk about them now. The, uh, why would you go to a vacuum tube technology? Well, they're a lot faster. In this case, it was about six times faster. It's far more reliable because those little filaments inside the tubes don't burn out. And they're about half the cost, much less uh, expensive to operate, much less expensive to cool, much less expensive to manufacture. So this machine, the 7090, uh, rented for about 63K a month in 60s dollars. That's about a little over half a million US dollars in, in today's dollars. So the name 79T, here's the story that I heard, was that it was the 709T as in tango. 79T, 79T, 7090T, and that was kind of the evolution of where the number came from. Is it true or is it just folklore? I don't know, but I like the story. Uh, it's the, exact, the rest of the characteristics, number of instructions, amount of memory, everything else is the same as the 709, the vacuum tube version. All right, let's move on to Project Gemini. Now, remember, Project Gemini not only had the, uh, the EVAs, the extravehicular activities, longer duration, but we had to have two aircraft in space. They had to rendezvous. So you had to actually control those two aircraft in space. So you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna take the thing that you just had, the 7094s, and you're gonna build them into something a little bit bigger. So now instead of having three of these, we have five of them, but most importantly, you can partition them. You can partition them into two separate systems, separate yet connected systems that can both run a production workload, if you will, that can both be controlling, or you could have one doing a mission and one doing testing and training or one doing a mission and one serving as backup, right? So we have some partitioning flexibility with the introduction of the real-time computing uh, center, RTCC, for Project Gemini. Now, it's still a custom operating system, but they're starting to use some of the more off-the-shelf uh, componentry from an operating system perspective. In particular, they use something called IBSYS, which was a input-output supervisor provided by IBM for these machines. Uh, they were using that as part of their processing. So we're starting to see a move into a uh, COTS commercial off-the-shelf, even for operating systems, which often in missions is the thing that has to be tailored the most. So let's talk a little bit about the 7094, all right? And that's one of the machines they'd moved into. It increased the instruction set to 274 uh, instructions. The basic machine cycle time was two microseconds. That, you know, considering how long ago this was, that's pretty impressive. The ability to do double precision floating point arithmetic is added. And then there's a second version of this that comes out, which has a shorter cycle time, less instructions for a certain common mathematical things like mathematician, uh, multiplications and divisions, and supports memory interleaving for even faster access to data. So that's the 7090 to 7094 transition they made during this time. And now we get to Project Apollo. Here we have it. Before I wanna talk about, uh, about Project Apollo, the mainframes and the mission, I really wanna spend a moment just pointing out the absolute remarkable characteristics of the larger of the rockets used, the Saturn V. There were some other Saturn rockets used earlier on, but by the time we got to Apollo 8 and 9, we were on the Saturn V rocket. 363 uh, tall, which means it's taller than the, um, Statue of Liberty here in New York, weighed 6.5 million pounds, 6.5 million pounds, all of which existed for the sole purpose of getting about 300,000 pounds into orbit, uh, into lower Earth orbit, and then getting about 100,000 pounds into lunar orbit. So the vast majority of weight associated with the Saturn V was simply to get things into that lower Earth, or what they call the parking orbit. Uh, this amazes me, the percentage of material that was, that I won't say went to waste, but that was used to finally bring that small capsule back with three astronauts and some moon rocks is pretty impressive. Now, I oh, absolutely love the design of this thing. It's a three-stage design, of, and it's three stages made by three completely different manufacturers. 
but the design process was so good that they could slap them together, slap them together. They could put them together after they had been delivered uh, down to Florida to the now Cape Kennedy uh, Center to the Vehicle Assembly and Testing Building. At one point, the largest structure in the world, I don't know, uh, uh, enclosed structure in the world, I'm not sure if that's still true, uh, but they would put these together and they would fit. So this is really testimony to the ability to design uh, specifications that could be consumed by somebody who was going to be build something on top of the specifications that you were delivering. So stage one uh, built by Boeing, five F-1 rockets. This thing would burn for only two minutes and 41 seconds. It was liquid oxygen and kerosene. And at the end of its burn, at the end of that little over two and a half minutes, it would be 30, <laughs> 31 nautical miles into the atmosphere, 50 miles downrange and moving at the speed of 7,000 feet per second. That is an awful lot of acceleration to occur in just two minutes and 40 seconds. But at that point, what happens, that bottom stage separates and the second stage takes over. That one was built by North American, had five slightly smaller rockets, five J2 rockets. It burned for six minutes and 32 seconds, liquid oxygen and, uh, liquid oxygen and hydrogen. All right, and at the end of that, it's, in, it's nearly in the parking orbit around the earth. And then the, it's discarded. And then the third stage, right? Built by Douglas has only one J2 rocket. Uh, it's the only one of the, all of these rockets that burns twice. The first is to get it into Earth, uh, the Earth orbit. And the second one is to leave the Earth orbit on its way to the moon, all right? So that first one is uh, about two minutes and the one to get to the moon is about six minutes. So that is, the, the, the wonderful Apollo Saturn V rocket. If you ever get the chance, there are a couple of these uh, at various places in the US. If you, if you go to Houston, they have, they're, they're either ones that were built and never used uh, or they're models, but the scale of them, just to stand next to them is, is absolutely breathtaking. So that's the one of the great pieces of technology. And we'll talk a little bit about how IT saved that mission in a few moments. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is I said I worked for Grumman. Uh, and I have to mention this when I'm talking about the Apollo program. Uh, when I worked at Grumman in the 80s, 80, 80 to 82, every once in a while, I'd work with somebody or meet somebody who worked on this program. And they'd speak about it with the reverence that they would reserve for their spouse, their children, and their grandchildren. This really was the job of a lifetime for the mission of a lifetime. So Grumman out in Bethpage, Long Island builds it. It's a two-stage design. So the whole thing lands on the moon and then only the top piece uh, takes off. What amazes me about this is you couldn't test it. <laughs> I think about that. Well, who deploys something without testing it? Well, you can't test it in lunar orbit, uh, excuse me, in lunar gravity, uh, because you can't, you know, there is no lunar gravity. You have to simulate all the testing you're going to do. Uh, and from what I've heard, those, those Grumman engineers were a bit on edge, and especially in Apollo 13, when this was the lifeblood that saved Apollo 13 crew, uh, just to make sure that the whole thing worked, and it did, it did, and it did flawlessly. Uh, it's flown manually, during final descent, and I'm sure all of us have heard those stories about the 1201 and 1202 alarms and don't need to go into there, but I'm just gonna say that training is so essential that when something goes wrong, you have to know how to react. And thankfully, thankfully the crew of Apollo 11 knew how to react. Uh, I, the mission was very simple. You launch, you go around the earth a few times, you branch off to the moon, you, you, they called translunar injection, that was a starting point. You'd circle the moon, uh, bear in mind the moon is, is moving while, while you're orbiting it, you're doing your mission, and then you leave, you engage in what's called trans-Earth insertion, and then you come back and land back on planet Earth. It looks so simple on paper, and it was one of the most complex engineering feats uh, ever attempted, probably still is. So now let's go back to the mainframe part of this, the, the mainstream of this afternoon symposia, the real-time computing center for Project Apollo. So they moved from the IBM 704s to, uh, to five IBM System 360 Model 75Js. These are responsible for launch systems, management of telemetry data, uh, calculation of any of the orbital work that has to be done, any of the mission planning, and of course, re-entry. Which means, by the way, of course, when Apollo 13, that disaster occurred where they had, as they were outbound to the moon, they had an oxygen tank explode and they could no longer land on the moon. They had to basically just ricochet to moon's orbit and come back consuming as little power as possible and as little oxygen and water as possible. 
all of those recalculations were done on the IBM System 360 Model J. But there were some other innovations that were much more planned since the creation of that Saturn V rocket had several million parts made by several hundred thousand individuals and about 20,000 different vendors. We had to come up with software that would help manage that entire project. So uh, NASA contractors, Rockwell and Caterpillar work with IPM and they, they come together and we create a database management system, which you now know and love as IMS. Right? So IMS made its uh, commercial debut, I think at 68 a year before, CI, uh, before Kix, uh, but it was, its reason for existence was the US uh, manned space program. Now, I said earlier that the initial uh, computing machines had their own operating system. And then we started using, or NASA started using some more commercial off the shelf things. Well, with IBM System 360 came the operating system OS 360. And it turns out that much of what NASA needed to do for these missions could be satisfied by OS 360. So we shipped source code back then. Uh, NASA took the base of OS 360 and they made a series of modifications to it that I find absolutely positively fascinating as somebody who now works on ZOS, which traces its lineage directly back. It's either the dad or the granddad, depends on how you wanna look at it. So uh, some of the things I'll talk about here, we're gonna get a little geeky for a moment, but that's okay because you guys are geeks. So System 360 Model 75J, I gotta tell you, one of my, my first real job as a computer operator was an, was an operator on two System 360 Model 75Js in Great Neck, New York for a company called Time Sharing Resources. Two machines, one meg of storage each, because that's as much as uh, I think they supported other than something called expanded store. We'll talk about that in a moment, but one meg of storage, they were, we were able to support uh, 400 to 500 simultaneously logged on uh, end users with sub-second response time. I mean, these things were uh, uh, amazing machines for their time. What made them so good? The first thing was, this was the first system in the IBM System 360 line that was fully hard-coded. <clears throat> that means every instruction had some circuitry behind it. There was no microcode, there was no millicode, there was no emulation. If you did an add, subtract, multiply, or divide, transistors, and they were transistors, not integrated circuits, were being engaged to do those operations. So we didn't have the overhead of simulation, emulation, or anything like that. Uh, it came, or it could be configured with up to one meg of storage with 750 nanosecond access time, uh, main core storage, iron core storage, four-way interleave storage. And I think the reason they did that is those main storage frames, hence the name mainframe, each existed. I think there were four of them, each of about 250K each. Now the purchase price was somewhere between 2.5 and $3.5 million, roughly about 20 to 30 million in today's dollars. So you can see that the mainframe was a pretty good business for IBM. From what I've heard, there weren't very many of these made. Right, so I'd be, it's, I'd never gotten the exact number, but one of the things, when I worked at TSR, one of the stories was that we bought our machines used from NASA. So in the back of my mind is this, I might have worked on one of these very, one of these five machines. I'm still trying to track that down. So that's the uh, 75J, the real time operating system. This was OS 360 modified to meet the specific needs of the Apollo program. So what they did is they recognized that the task dispatcher in the operating system wasn't fast enough. So they completely rewrote that. And one of the concepts they have in, uh, in MVS, all tasks have a parent. They had the concept of parentless tasks, right? So the reason why they did this is they created what I consider one of the, uh, a, one of the first server types of applications. They would have up to 15 of these tasks, each running in its own PSW key. And for the hardware folks and for folks who do system integrity on Z, you recognize that th that's a storage isolation key, right? The value is between one and 15. By giving each task its own, that gives you the ability to fence off each task's work from the other tasks. So that was that was pretty, pretty cool. Uh, it The, neat, the um, standard timer that was shipped with the uh, System 360 Model 75 didn't have sufficient granularity. So they had to come up with one that had granularity down to 10 microseconds. They came up with a, a mechanism to do real time IO support of device drivers, of, of devices. And I'll show you a picture in a moment of the, the, um, 
the, uh, the control center. You've seen this photo a million times of all those guys in the white shirts, jackets, smoking cigarettes around those consoles, sitting in front of a about 11 inch TV screen, 11 to 12 inch TV screen. I've been told that those TV screens were manufactured by Philco and all of those machines, all of those TVs were directly connected back to the System 360 Model 75 through a 2701 control unit. That's pretty cool. So I said it supports one meg of storage. There actually was an add-on called the 2361 Large Core Storage, gives you four meg of additional storage. And what they would use that for is, as the mission progressed, you had the need for different pieces of software, different subroutines you could think of it as. So what they would do is they would pre-stage those into the, uh, the LCS, the Large Core Storage. It would sit there and then when it was needed in the one meg of storage, it could be copied into very, very quickly. They did have the concept of a fast swap over to a failing system. Uh, so if the main system failed, they could switch over to the backup and that would take about 10 seconds and would save data and would save status. So that, that was for a time, very impressive. And we see the start of something that every time I fire up Jez and I see one of those HASP message, I think about this. Uh, the Houston Automatic Spooling Priority or HASP system slash environment was created to control job input and output. So there, there's something where there's a direct lineage straight down to the, the thing we know and love today as JES2. So there's that iconic Apollo control unit, uh, control room. There you have all those controllers. You know, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's very big and it's not, right? They're all sitting there at their controllers. I, uh, you can see the coffee cups sitting right there. We'd never do that in, a, in, a, in, a, in an IT room today. Um, each of those TV screens, as I said, connected right back to the System 360 Model 70 time, providing real time information to these folks. Uh, if you ever get to visit the US, and I hope you do, and if you ever get to visit Houston, Texas, and I hope that you do, do visit the Johnson Space Center. They have just renovated this, I think it was last year, just open to the public, um, and it, it's absolutely magnificent to be in the same room where Gene Krantz and all of those other controllers were holding their breath till they heard those magic words, uh, the eagle has landed. All right, so we're gonna talk about something here. It's not a mainframe, uh, but it's such great technology and it saved the bacon of a mission. And that is the Saturn instrument unit. So you remember when I talked about the Saturn rocket, I'm gonna page back a little bit because I can get to it real quickly. And if I can't, I'm not, there it is, Saturn rocket, three-stage rocket, right? Well, right at the top, right? Right where that gantry arm is, is there, there's a little black ring. Right. That's approximately where this thing called the Saturn Instrumentation Unit was. And the purpose of the Saturn Instrumentation Unit is it controlled the flight completely from, I think it was about 30 seconds before liftoff until they had uh, jettisoned the, uh, the third stage. Right. So every aspect of that was controlled, of the launch was controlled by this. And, and the reason why that's so important is somebody made a very explicit design choice, which was, what do we do in the event of the failure of the communication systems during these critical flights? If they were using a completely ground control mechanism, the rocket would be uncontrolled. So the Saturn instrumentation unit had gyroscopes to measure position. It had the, the flight plan necessary from that, as I said, about 30 seconds before from the order to ignite till the time of actual liftoff, till the time of the actual separation uh, of the third stage and everything was controlled by that. Now it was built by IBM Huntsville, Alabama uh, based on processors made by IBM Owego. Uh, it's as I said, responsible for everything up to getting into that parking orbit and it saved the Apollo 12 mission. And the Apollo 12 mission was a mission they decided they were going to get, uh, they were going to do a launch when the weather was a little questionable. There were thunderstorms off in the distance. There was a fair amount of moisture and I think even some precipitation around the launch area, but they go ahead with the mission and the uh, Saturn V lifts off and it goes for about a little less than a minute. And nobody realized that, that uh, the result of combustion of all of that thrust being generated is a gigantic conductive cloud. And as soon as I say conductive cloud, a lot of folks would say, oh, this can't be good. And it wasn't because there's a lightning strike and suddenly they lose all telemetry data. The videos are out on YouTube, go watch them. You can see the looks, you can you literally see the controllers jumping back. They've never seen this happen before. The screens go completely blank. The Saturn instrumentation unit 
kept that Saturn V going all the way into the parking orbit and gave them the time necessary to recover from this. The recovery from it is an equally amazing story. Uh, Google, SCE to AUX, right? And what this was, there was a controller, John Aaron is his name, famous controller, who sees this happen. He's the EECOM, the Electronics and Environments, uh, gentleman who's in charge of all of that. He remembers that he has seen this in a test run year, maybe 18 months before. And most impressively, he remembers the recovery procedure, which is tell the astronauts to set SCE to OSC. Now, one of the rules in a mission is nobody talks to an astronaut except another astronaut. So John has to tell the flight director, hey, flight director, tell him to set SCE to OSC. What? Sierra Charlie Echo, Echo to Alpha Uniform X-ray. So the flight director then passes that on to the person known as Capcom. That's the astronaut on the ground who's the only person who talks to the astronauts in the air and says, tell them to set SCE to AUX. What? Sierra Charlie Echo to Alpha Uniform X-ray. So he gets on the radio, set SCE to AUX. What? Goes through the whole thing. And thankfully, the, uh, the astronaut sitting in the middle seat knows, oh, I don't know exactly what that is, reaches over, flips the switch, and all of the telemetry is restored. And the, what, so two pieces of magic in that. Number one, they had tested this scenario. Somebody remembered this scenario and the designers recognized that there might be conditions where the signal information coming in was not sufficient. And instead of expecting a clean signal, right? They should accept whatever data they can get. And SCE is signal conditioning equipment to aux, to auxiliary, which basically says, take whatever signal you can get. You know, in, in anything related to something that has real-time demands, preparation, preparation, preparation is key. And this demonstrated it uh, in spades. So all of this leads to what we know happened, the lunar landing on the 20, 20th of July in 1969. Uh, it, it launched on the 16th, came back on the 24th. You know, they, I, re, I thought they spent days on the moon. They didn't, they didn't spend a lot of time at all. Two and a half hours on the moon. They grabbed 50 pounds of rocks and they ran. And that was Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Mike Collins. I, I love Mike Collins. Uh, he's orbiting, he's just going around, going around the dark side of the moon. He's the ultimate designated driver. His buddies are downstairs having the fun. He's just waiting for them to come back and pick them up. He's got some interesting writings on what it's like to be in solitude at that point and the dark side of the moon. Uh, fascinating, fascinating stuff. Uh, what I also love, this was really a unifying, uh, unifying activity. I remember be where I was when men landed on the moon. I remember sitting in a room with lots of other folks watching a grainy black and white TV, recognizing that I was watching history in the making. And it's estimated that 20% of the population on earth share that experience with me. That's amazing. So, uh, Apollo 11, that lunar landing successful was it? The end of what we did in space, absolutely not. We had six additional Apollo missions. 10 more men got the opportunity to take steps on the moon. There were additional missions planned. There were three additional missions that in the budget crisis of the 70s got canceled. Uh, some of that material, th th that's very sad that that happened, but the good news is that there were in process materials being built, in process Saturn Vs, and in particular, in process lunar modules. And if you really wanna see a lunar module up close and in personal, the Cradle of Aviation Museum in, in, uh, in Long Island, it's not in Bethpage, it's uh, Mitchell Field, I can't remember the town name, uh, but they actually have a real lunar module, one built for one of, these, one of these canceled missions. And when I went and visited a few years ago, my tour guide, my docent, was a guy who worked on a manufacturing floor at Grumman. I'm telling you, there's just such great materials to go find in these little out of the way museums. Cradle of Aviation, and of course, the Houston uh, Johnson Space Center, great to, work to visit. All right, so the Apollo program, the tail end gets canceled. Uh, but before that, we have the joint Apollo-Soyuz mission, the US and the Soviet Union using Apollo hardware. Uh, have a mission. We have Space Lab, not the most successful of space things, but we do have to uh, recognize it. The space shuttle was viewed as the replacement for the manned lunar program. Uh, and that was part of the reason why these Apollo missions were canceled, would have put funding into that. And then of course we have the still running now International Space Station. Uh, there's a website, you can Google it, you can find out where it is. And it's very cool when it's flying over where you are at night to go up and look at it. Easy to spot, recommend it highly. 
So uh, I, I said we're going to talk about the, the, the lunar program. I'm going to spend a moment talking about the space shuttle because the space shuttle had some interactions with things that are near and dear to my heart, like RACF and ZOS. So the space shuttle program made extensive use of ZOS. So it used IMS, JES3, PL1, HL Assembler, C++, RACF, all listed there, ZVM, and Z Linux on Z. I, I, I was astounded when I found that out. This was involved in the planning execution, uh, planning and uh, the ground kinds of activities. But interestingly, on board in the space shuttle, there were five computers, IBM AP101S general purpose machines. These were based on the IBM System 360 architecture, right? So all of those other things, ZOS, IMS, they were there to build software that could then be packaged up and loaded into these 360 emulation machines that were running. And again, uh, redundancy is key. There were five of these. I think four were built by one manufacturer, one by a, another manufacturer, and every operation was performed multiple times and compared against them. And one of the machines was loaded with the, uh, with the re-entry. Uh, work. So if, if everything else failed and the mission had to be cut short, there was one machine that was able to bring the, uh, the uh, space shuttle home. Uh, and part of the reason was the space shuttle was not an easy to fly machine at all. This machine, by the way, the AP-101S was also used on several other military aircraft, B-1, B-52 and F-15s. And if you want more information on this, there's a share presentation by Jan Green from United Space Alliance. Uh, it's, it's from 2007. There is the link. It's a fascinating, fascinating read. So what happened to the mainframe? Everybody in this room knows what happened to the mainframe since 1969. It continued to evolve. System 370, System 390, the, the evolution has gone on for 50 years and it continues to go on through all the machines that I've, I've listed there up to the Z15. And I, I love Mark Anzani's story about he had a, a piece of hardware from something he had worked on that was actually taken up on the space shuttle, returned and he got the certificate of authenticity and that, that's absolutely great. But in addition to something cool like that, while an operational mainframe never made it to the lunar surface, 37 IBMers had their name inscribed uh, on metal and uh, uh, NASA was honoring the folks who were the key contributors to the, to the uh, lunar program. So 37 of the names on there, and there were a couple of hundred, uh, was left on the lunar surface during the Apollo 15 mission in recognition of all the work done by all the contractors. So that in just a little bit less than an hour is my version of the story of mainframes in the moon. Uh, I'll close with one thought. I'm, I'm always worried when, when I talk a lot about the history of this platform because I love this platform. Uh, but there's a great quote by um, Henry Ford, Henry Ford, the industrialist. He said, history is more or less bunk. And a lot of people stop at that point. But the rest of the quote I think is, is the most relevant part. And it's uh, history is more or less bunk, it's tradition. We don't want tradition. We want to live in the present. And the only history that is worth a tinker's damn today is the history that we make today. I love looking at the history of the, of the platform because I, it reminds me of how great it is. And I know an even better future is ahead for the IBM Z mainframe. So I've just blathered on for quite a bit. Jamie, do we have any questions? Um, we don't have any questions. I think we have lots of comments. So let me read some of them out to you. So James Harper says, uh, was the 7090 the mainframe featured in Hidden Figures? Uh, yes, it was. Good question. Uh, yes. And, <laughs> and, and by the way, what I'm going to suggest you do with the movie is excellent. The book is far more detailed and you can see there were a lot of liberties taken to make a, a, a more dramatic effect. Uh, but yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, that was, it was a machine. Right. And then uh, there's a really funny comment here from James Vincent. He says, who deploys something without testing? Question mark, question mark. <laughs> Aha, I have a list. That's a great one. <laughs> okay. there's, there's, a, there's a great meme of that guy who, who is the, um, the most interesting man in the world. And he, and he says, I don't test, but when I test, I test in production. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> of course. <laughs> we never do that. No, 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 definitely not. No. Uh, there's a comment from Colin and backed up by Alan saying they're absolutely loving this presentation. Thank you. And uh, Kurt says, I do like hearing Owego now lock, lock at me. Sorry, you mentioned the company you used to work for oh. in, in Endicott, where I started an IBM in the material. Very impressive. I think I have the IBM stockholders report that showed that first that first calculator as well. Very fun and mm -hmm. interesting material. 
Yeah. Oh, it is. When, when, when I did this, at a, I've, I've done this internally in Poughkeepsie, and I did it at our local library, and there were two people in the room, one of who actually worked on the 701, which is the predecessor of the 704, which started the whole thing off, and another gentleman who had actually worked in, uh, in DC in the real-time computing center. So yeah, it's, it's great when you can meet the people who actually walked in the steps of history. I'm just looking back. They were there. <laughs> Uh, James Vincent says, I was in the VMCP internals training in Atlanta with some of the VM folks working on the shuttle. The stories they couldn't tell us. Wow, he says. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there's, a, there's a gentleman in IBM who uh, worked on the software on the, on the ZOS site. And the stories they told about the reliability and the, the things they did uh, to inspect code and to validate that code was correct. Uh, you know, when, when the shuttle Challenger, uh, the Challenger shuttle disaster occurred and they did the analysis, Richard Feynman, the great physicist, the guy with the, who pointed out the, the rubber O-ring issue uh, to Congress, uh, he, he, he complimented NASA on the way, the rigor that they had in their onboard computing. Absolutely. Great. Uh, Alien says mainframe rocks. Absolutely. Back here 100% there, Alien. <laughs> uh, Sandy says, Wasn't, uh, was Margaret Hamilton part of the IBM team? Uh, boy, that's a great question. I don't think so, but she was obviously essential in, in doing the programming work back then. Uh, but I, I got to go, I go look at that. I, I, I don't think she was, but would have loved if you were. <laughs> yeah, no, great. Oh, there's, there's, there's some more nice comments as well there for you, Mark. Um, but uh, thank you everybody for your contribution. And Mark, a virtual <laughs> round of you. applause. Thank you so much. That was such an excellent session as always. And thank you. Um, yeah, it's such a powerful story, though, isn't it? It's you know. Oh, it uh, is, and, and 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 I'm sure there are other ones. So if you know of other ones, start telling the stories. Well, yes. Not not as a recognition of what happened, but as this is what we did, and here's what we can do. Absolutely, and uh, oh, one, one comment coming in some from Morty says did not know that um, Houston Auto, or HASP, as I've always known it as, auto, a Houston automatic spooling priority. Do you know what, that is, I, I remember you saying this before and I was like, the, the hundreds of times I've seen that in the, you know, in, in jazz and it's like, <laughs> you just don't, you think oh. this, this originated from somewhere, didn't it? And yeah, yeah and, and uh, it's fascinating, it really is. And you won't forget now. <laughs> uh, no, definitely not. <laughs> So thank you, everybody. And Mark, like I said, thank you. Excellent session. Um, this is session uh, 1SC for the purpose of feedback. Um, I don't know if you've got the slide. Yep, you have. Uh, great, Mark. So that QR code there will take you directly uh, to the feedback. So please do do that for Mark. And uh, if that doesn't work for you. Sorry, Mark. I noticed I got a minute left. Can I tell a story? Of course you can. Go for it. This is, this is a story. I'll leave the QR code up here in a bit, but I do have to show this. So Apollo 13 happens. I made reference to it that they, they have the oxygen tank explodes. They literally take, they live off the lunar module. It was designed to get people to the moon and back, and that was it. They live off this thing. And, and you know, the people at Grumman were on edge the whole time. Can it do this? We think it can do this. They figured out how to do the power-up sequence in the movie. It's credited to one of the astronauts. That was, they, they, did all, they did a lot of that work. Right, so this whole thing's going, the world is holding its breath. I, I remember this when I was a kid, the world is holding its breath and they have the successful landing. And, and I love the movie Apollo 13. One of the things it captures is there's like two minutes of radio silence. We had no idea if they survived. They had, when they finally saw the, uh, the parachute, everybody is happy. Well, I'm gonna get the, I'll bring the QR code back in a moment. So what happens, engineers have a sense of humor. The engineers over at Grumman go out and they type up a bill, a towing bill that they send to the people who manufactured the rest in uh, North American Rockwall, I think it was. And the bill is for towing. And uh, I'm gonna I'll read a couple of things in here. $4 for the first, mi first mile, $10 each additional mile, uh, trouble call, fast service, battery charge, $400,000. Um, sleeping accommodations for two, no TV, air conditioned with radio, American plan. Uh, personalized trip ticket. They mail this bill off to North American Grumman, <laughs> right? Who absolutely brilliantly, they get it. They think it's funny. They send Grumman a bill for the fees to lug the lunar module <laughs> into space. So engineers have a sense of humor. That's my, I, I absolutely love that. Oh, they certainly do have a sense of humor. <laughs> it's priceless. Yep. 
So yes, uh, thanks for that, Mark. So yeah, don't forget to leave your feedback for Mark. Uh, so it's session one SC, scan that QR code and also use the link. Um, you can also go to the agenda, click on Mark's uh, keynote session. Uh, and if you go into his session, then you can go right down to the bottom and you'll also see the feedback yep. link there. Really important, like I say, uh, for feedback, not for only for, for Mark's benefit, but for GSE, but it also goes towards your CPE, CPD certificate, uh, the number of hours there. Um, and uh, yeah, thank, did you want to say, Mark, I know you, you took us a few beautifully earlier on about the charity. <laughs> Listen, I, one of the things I love about GSC is that they always support charitable efforts. I love the fact that prior conferences, speakers could say, don't give me the pen set or whatever the, the, the trinket is, you know, make the contribution instead. I love that. Uh, and I love the fact that you're doing it now. Uh, it's a great thing. So thank you. I've, I've clicked already. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you, Mark. So uh, that's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope you've had a great day. Um, it's not by means the end of the conference. We're back tomorrow um, at 9 a.m. Uh, GMT, by the way. Sorry, Mark, you're going to have to get up at 4 a.m. again. <laughs> so there's lots of sessions on tomorrow. So uh, please do join us if you can. And Mark will also be back. He's got sessions um, on the security stream um as the as the conference moves on so thank you everybody have a wonderful day wonderful evening whatever you're up to and we'll see you tomorrow thank you again mark take care thanks for inviting me